Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, a good weekend. And we're going to, in fact, that probably was over yesterday. <laughs> and we're going to have a great week. I uh, now have the pleasure of announcing to you that on a week from Wednesday, April 25th, Meta is having an open house uh, near our office here, the First Congregational Church. And you're all invited and uh, bring your friends, especially wealthy ones. And uh, <laughs> next week I'll actually start talking to you about who's going to be coming so we can get the right amount of food and so forth. But there's going to be music, food, and inspiration, partly latter partly provided by you. <coughs> Um, the box that I told you about that was on our shelf that had resources for 164B seems to have uh, walked away. Uh, so I'm just going to be bringing stuff in as it comes across my desk in hopes that it will be useful to, for us to take the pulse of what's going on in nonviolence around the world. This is Peace News, which is a British magazine, a uh, newsletter. And it will show you that there is a lot, a lot of resistance uh, to every level, every aspect of militarization slash globalization from above slash 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 and burn. Thing. <laughs> Going on probably more actively in the UK than it is in the US right now. I'm not sure about the rest of Europe. But this will give you a sense of what's going on over there and, and that newspaper. And there are one other resource I wanted to share with you, and that is that the Progressive uh, magazine has an interview with Gene Sharp. So he's uh, of our – I almost said godfather, but uh, grandfather of uh, peace research. Okay. Uh, now still on the resource category. I mailed you all by CourseWeb a longish article by uh, Marisa Handler, who is a very good San Francisco-based writer and uh, singer. Uh, and she had spent a lot of time with the Sarayaku in uh, Colombia. I think it was Colombia. Venezuela, Colombia, somewhere around there. And I wanted you to look at that in some detail as an example of the ad hoc resistance movements that are springing up all over the world as the globalization machine gets in the face of indigenous people. And you find varying degrees of nonviolence being practiced there. And in this particular case, there was an interesting example for us to look at. It's very much, uh, very much in the gray area where these uh, soldiers came to impose uh, their program. It was mostly about uh, oil exploration. They were going to set off explosives in the jungle to test what's going on under the ground and all those other things. So there's plenty of room around here. And um, they were confronted by women uh, from the village with spears who took these men into custody and took their guns away and then gave them a long speech and gave them their guns back, at by which time they were converted enough to where they didn't use those guns. So it's a sort of uh, tempting situation, but of course it's, it's, it's using wrong means even though you don't intend to carry through with them. You're not actually planning to spear these guys, I assume. They weren't planning to do that. But they were definitely using threat power in order to contain the threat that they were posing so that they could then move on to persuasive means. So, I mean, you, you read something like this and you want to just say, yes, you know, this is the way to do it. But it is dicey. For one thing, as uh, Marisa points out, the soldiers were very much outnumbered by these women with spears. If they were not, then you'd have a different situation. So again, I leave you with this very uncomfortable dot, dot, dot. Don't know quite what to say about this, but I warned you in the beginning, this is PAX 164B. There'll be a lot of gray areas and a <coughs> lot of dot, dot, dots because we're dealing with the real world now. Yeah? Do you think it's better to do something like this that's in a gray area than 
Uh, on the whole, I would say, yeah, it's better to do a gray area action than to do nothing at all. It will be very, very rare that what the situation will call for is passivity and doing nothing. And, you know, at, at best, you'll end up losing the initiative, and that's always bad for nonviolent actors. So I guess what we're talking about here is someone, people who did a gray area thing. Hmm. That's interesting, RB. I'm going to mention an example very close to doing nothing at all that worked out rather well, actually, when I finished the sentence. But knowing me, I might never finish the sentence if this goes on and on, always parentheses. Um, I guess what we would say about these villagers is that whatever they did and whatever kind of weapons they displayed, they did it with the right intention. Their intention was to block the aggression and then use the space thus created to do persuasion. So we have to give them a lot of credit for that. If your intentions are good, even if you're packing a, an 11-foot spear <laughs> or whatever it was they had, that's going to count for a lot that your intentions are good. You're not actually relying on the weaponry. But after all is said and done, I, I'm you know, arguing out of both sides of our mouth here. After all is said and done, that's the language that the soldiers understood. It's a lot like the stone throwing in the Israeli-Palestine situation. You, it can't actually do a whole lot of damage, though there has been one person who lost his eye in the course of all of these years. Norm, most of the time it cannot do a lot of damage, but it's a form of defiance. And that's a, a, any day better than passivity. Okay, I actually finished the sentence. Hold on to your question, Mike. The example I was going to use is a very <laughs> old one. It comes from the 18th century, and it's in this wonderful book called Christian Non-Resistance Explained and Defended by Aidan Ballou, which is one of the early old classics on nonviolence. And he tells a story in there about the Sandwich Islanders who, who were regarded by the French as their colony. The French imposed a liquor tax. The islanders refused to pay the tax, pointing out – and it is rather logical – that they weren't drinking any French liquor, so why should they pay a tax on it? But that wasn't logical enough for the colonial mentality and the gunboat of French marines comes to the island. The people turned to their king and said, what shall we do? And he said, you know, Physical resistance would be ridiculous. We have nothing but sticks and stones, and they have these modern, sophisticated flintlock rifles that can fire around <coughs> every two minutes, um, and bayonets and all the rest of it. So let's not try to fight them. Let's not get in their way at all. Let's pretend that they're tourists. And so that's what they did. You know, the Marines landed and said, uh, Méfiez-vous, you know, watch your step, which is the French Marines. And they said, hello, how are you? And there was a, f a fort on the island. I don't know who had built that fort. The Marines said, we are going to attack this fort. The islanders said, uh, comme vous voudrez. You know, it's up to whatever you want to do. So they, were, they uh, felt good because they attacked the fort and burned it and came away doing the gray lag goose dance. You know, we triumphed, we triumphed. So their ego was gratified. They never did anything to the islanders. They hurt nobody. They collected no taxes. And it was considered in the early days a very good example of nonviolent resistance, which was pretty close to doing nothing. <coughs> but normally it's much better, as Gandhi would say, if you really have a choice between violence and cowardice, go for violence. You can s grow. You can a convert, evolve from violence into nonviolence. You cannot get to non to nonviolence from cowardice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Paolo. Again, I didn't quite get You're saying you go nonviolence. You yes, that's right. You weren't here in 164A. Y if you want, if you are a coward, and you know who you are, you know, will all cowards raise their hands, please. <laughs> if you are a coward. 
in a given situation or in a given relationship, you will not be able to exhibit nonviolence in that relationship. And actually, there, is, there are some startling examples where you would be better off fighting back with whatever you've got because you can get from there to the renunciation of weapons. But you can't get to the renunciation of weapons from the non-possession of weapons. You don't have anything to fight back with. You've got nothing to give up. So the uh, anecdotal example that I used last semester was someone wrote to Gandhi and said, a bully slapped me on the face. It probably was the same bully that you used to see in these comic books who are always attacking people on the beach and taking away their girlfriend. And this is an advertisement for Charles Atlas' bodybuilding course, which I was sorely tempted as a scrawny teenager to sign up for but <laughs> could not afford it. Uh, anyway, uh, where was I? Uh, <laughs> uh, a bully slapped me. I felt humiliated. What should I have done? I did nothing. <coughs> and Gandhi wrote back and said, you should have slapped him right back. But he added, why did you feel humiliated? You know, it was his problem. He's the idiot who goes around slapping scrawny teenagers <laughs> or whoever <laughs> it was. Why should you feel humiliated? But once you've gotten yourself into that subordinate position, you really have to get out of that before you can do yourself or anybody any good. So, yeah, Mike? So the reason that you should slap back is because you felt humiliated. Mm-hmm. So we have three positions here. Feel humiliated but do nothing about it. That is uh, tamas on this, on this three guna scale, tamas, inertia, Rajas, restless activity, sattva, balance, harmonized energy, anything like that. Just talk about covering a lot of ground <laughs> in a set of parentheses. So the lowest possible situation is to feel humiliated and not do anything. Better feel humiliated <coughs> and act however you can in that situation with your resources very limited. Act however you can to restore your dignity as a means of offering dignity to the other person. And best thing would be not to have felt humiliated in the first place. Then you could, you could come back in some appropriate way and say, are you having some kind of problem? Was my cheek in the way of your hand or <laughs> something like that? Yeah. So what was your earlier question? Or was that it? Oh, about the women's experience. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So it was in that sense a nonviolent response uh, because it was like the Rosenstrasse prison demonstration. The people, the women who came and uh, got in the face of the Gestapo did not have overpowering weaponry. They just used the weaponry. They, they had nothing. But uh, this is a, as I say, this is like the stone throwing in uh, the Palestinian situation because you're using something to demonstrate your resistance and your unwillingness to accept the subjugation that's being imposed on you. You're not doing this in order to harm, not really. Shannon? Uh-huh. Yes, I mean, that would be very different if you say, okay, hand in your weapons and line up against the wall. Now we've got your AK-47s or whatever it is. That was very different. But if you're using – this is getting more and more interesting the more we think about it. You're using threat power to disarm threat power. So there's this very slender area in which you can actually do – what Ronald Reagan and Reaganites say is the only thing that you can do to get to peace, which is peace through strength. <coughs> peace through strength. You use your threat power to disarm our position. As soon as you've got them disarmed, you say, let's talk. And they're impressed by your courage and by your compassion that you're not attacking them when, when you have a position of advantage. And so you've created a platform where you can carry on the conversation by normal conversational means. So this is the kind of thing which I normally say does not exist. And I still say as a generalization that will work. 
but there are these really slender areas where you can use threat power of a kind to disarm threat power of by people who are committed to it because they see no alternative and then talk to them about an alternative. So first Joe and then Matt. Uh huh. <laughs> of course not. Yeah. Right. Yeah, which is why I say that it's a gray area within a gray area. I mean that 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 show has uh, I've had a lot of trouble with it and. Uh, I've become very unpopular with tre Trekkies, which is a very uncomfortable <laughs> situation to be in. Um, but yeah, it takes – you see how long it's taken us to get to this question from a position where we could discuss it intelligently. And I have thought this was a very intelligent discussion up to now, incidentally. So to think – that you could start with those situations right away with people who know nothing, which is to say ordinary human beings living in an industrial civilization, absolutely clueless about nonviolence. It won't work because they think it's the only way. I think I've shared with you that I came up with this slogan during the Reagan era, strength through peace, which I thought was uh, really terrific and you know, s stood a lie on its head and made it turn out being the truth. And what was it? I wrote uh, an op-ed called Strength Through Peace. Op-ed was accepted by some fairly considerable newspaper, you know, the Wee Hawken Gazette Daily or something like that. <laughs> and so I eagerly rushed to the stands to see, me see myself in print and there was the title, Peace Through Strength. You see what I'm saying? That if you do something – a little bit abnormal, people will turn it into a, what is for them normal. So to use this argument early on in the conversation that we can use threat power to get people into a situation of conversion is dangerous. I guess thinking about it now, one of the few places I would say that it has to be applied is in criminal justice. You know, you have people r running around committing crimes. You do not – the peace officers do not uh, approach them with their little wallet-sized nonviolent communication card in their hand and say, you know, are you having some kind of a problem? What are your real needs here? No. You have to, you know, slam them up against the police car, handcuff them with their hands behind their back, all that stuff. Get them into a situation where you can then apply rehabilitation. And you can restore their dignity, their sense of self-respect um, in that situation. That would be a case where I think you would have to, because of the lateness of the stage of the conflict and because of the danger to other people for whom you are responsible if you're a peace officer, that's your job is to apply threat power to bring about a situation where you could have conversation. Unfortunately, what we do is once we've applied the threat power, we just say, well, let's, we, let's, uh, we're on a roll. Let's keep these guys in little cages now. Hang on one second, Shannon. Matt? It's – yeah. <coughs> it's, it, it's embarrassing as far as Nagler's Law is concerned. It kind of <laughs> puts Nagler's Law <laughs> on the shelf. Uh, let's see if by using clever rhetorical maneuvers we can rescue some kind of a, of a reconciliation here. Mike, do you have – I don't think it's fair to do it. I mean like it uh -huh. works, it works out there. But like, do you go on that threat power? Like uh -huh. there's no equal match there. Like, there's no well, way I to do it based on that threat power. Mm -hmm. there's no equal match there. No, we've, I think yeah, – we've already said that you can't take what these women – did and institutionalize it. You can't plan to use it in other situations. What we're only talking about is given their situation, what they did worked. And here, here's the clever 
rhetorical argument that I had up my sleeve. Uh, again, we go back to the question of intention. It wasn't so much threat power, and this is maybe what you're saying, Mike, that it wasn't all that threatening. Though, as Marisa points out, the, the soldiers were outnumbered, and that was part of it. It wasn't all that threatening to be surrounded by women with spears. Um, I hope that doesn't come across <laughs> as a sexist remark or a pre-Amazonian <laughs> consciousness here. Um, so really it was more a display of refusal to be subjugated than it was a threat. So in that sense we would say and, and really this is getting so cagey that I'm not sure I would really want to argue this in public. But we are just here in this small pri <coughs> privileged environment with people watching <laughs> all over the world and getting emails from Somalia and Isfahan places. Um, but just entre nous, um, uh, if you stick with intention, you stay on that level, it isn't even really a violation of Nagler's law because it's not really violence. It's a demonstration of refusal to be subjugated. Very tricky. Don't plan on it. Don't make strategic manuals based on this. It's too subtle a point. It, you cannot use it in the, in the early stages of your conversation with your relatives or your roommates or people that you meet in the library. Shannon? Oh, excuse me. So one second, Shannon. By the way, uh, if you have friends who want to watch the webcast uh, or are in any other way intelligent, hip, and sophisticated alert people, uh, you can now go directly on to metacenter.org. And the last semester and this semester are just clickable right through. Okay. Shannon? Isn't the difference between power and Isn't that – Clever. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Okay, I, I hang on one a minute, Ari. I like this very much that what you're doing is using threat power for disarmament, not for reciprocation. Unfortunately, as we know in the real world, 999 times out of 1,000, your threat power is interpreted as reciprocation and it has exactly the opposite effect. So we're talking about a rare situation, possibly because it's women, because their weapons are so outclassed. They're demonstrate in a way, they're demonstrating their vulnerability. You know, it's like that thing we saw from the Philippines. Look, this is the, this is the most that we've got. It's ridiculous, but it's what we've got, and we're not we're going to use it until you guys, come around. Um, has everybody got this, by the way? The, the, okay, this, <laughs> this is going to be. Uh, Okay, this – we'll get back to that. We'll get back to that. <laughs> okay, I ho hope this has gone out over the airwaves. Yeah. John Lindsay Poland's talk got almost this complicated. I was impressed. Uh, during the Cold War, there was a program that was put forward. Uh, it was called GRIT, which was a very good acronym. It appealed to just the right people. The kind of people who go around beating up scrawny teenagers on the beach. Uh, and <laughs> what it stood for was graduated <coughs> reciprocal initiatives in tension reduction. And the way it worked was, okay, you have these two moronic superpowers pumped up on testosterone, squared off against one another, laying waste to the entire global economy. What should they do? Well, one option was uh, to disarm. I remember being at a talk with uh, Helen Caldicott, the famous Australian doctor who started Physicians for Social Responsibility. And she said, what do you think the Russians would do if we disarmed? 
And the audience was stunned for a while, and somebody raised his hand and said, I think they'd be impressed. So we're, we weren't calling for that with grit, but you make one step in the direction like we're going to disarm all of our faulty multiple reentry hydrogen bombs. Okay, just we're just going to do it uh, on our own hook. And you wait for them to reciprocate. And they say, okay, we're going to scuttle two of our submarines, something like that, which seems to be happening automatically now anyway. Uh, and then you do another one, which is a little bit bigger, and they do another one, and you do exactly what Shannon was talking about. You build trust by building down your threat power. So this is like the ideal way to go about it. You know it's the ideal because nobody did it. Okay. Anything intelligent was not to be adopted in that, in that era. Pardon my cynicism. But if you can't do it this way because you're not an answering superpower with the same level of strength, you do what you can do. So I think we're getting somewhere with this. It's, it's, uh, let's see. Who else? Was it Matt? Did you have something else? Or? You went already. Oh, oh, that's right. Ashley. Uh huh. Well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I th I don't think of women as symbols. Well, I'm teasing. I know what you mean, <laughs> but they what what they were embodying was uh, physical vulnerability and spiritual strength. And I think that's kind of a perfect combination. That's why Gandhi said, in the when the new age dawns and we've got nonviolence all over the place, women will be playing an even more prominent role. Right. Uh, okay. Mike, Arby, and Marisa. I, I'm really weak on Surayu weaponry, Surayaku weaponry, I, and I couldn't tell you. But I think I remember in Maurice's article that they showed up with these things upright. So that's very different. We've got these things. Okay, we have a certain vulnerability, but we have a certain pride, and we're asking you to respect both. In a way, that was a tension-reducing. Mechanism. It's not like they threw a volley of spears over the hill and then came out, <laughs> you know, say, now let's talk. <laughs> Arby? Uh, I actually think on that, um, I think it is a really like thin line between yeah. disarming because, I mean, that disarming, uh, like the opposition or whatever, could lead to like making that space or it could also lead to like something as bad as genocide. Of course. And so, to stop you before you get to your second thing, what is going to make the difference? Okay, let's say you 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 got in a position where you've disarmed your opposition, and it's going to break one of two different ways here. Either you're going to take advantage and roll over them, or you're going to say, okay, now neither now you have lost your arms and we've lain ours down, so let's talk like human beings. So what's going to make the difference? Intention, yeah. Purity of intention and your power to hold on to your intention. Because don't forget, once you see those soldiers without their weapons, the temptation. <laughs> uh, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah. Marisa? Oh, I'm sorry, Arby. You had another thing. <coughs> uh, well, if you have to, if that's really the only choice you've got, you have no way to implement nonviolence in a given situation. Okay. Your only choice is between violence and cowardice. Well, like with that and then when she said like to both all of you to feel humiliated and do nothing about it. Yeah. Um, I thought that was those two together are very dangerous when it comes to being violent. Mm -hmm. so it seems like that would just perpetuate this like cycle of violence. What is it that would perpetuate the cycle? Like it would seem that like one of the one of the hardest things like, uh -huh. No, I, 
you know, I, I think, Arby, if you confuse the, the non-use of weapons with uh, fear, we'll be starting off on the wrong foot, if I understand what you're saying. Um, if you want to get gang members who are relying on numbers and weaponry and stealth for their c courage and dignity, if you want to get them to another place, you have to relocate their sense of dignity. You have to give them dignity through another means. And so there's this wonderful case of uh, an American-born Zen Buddhist in San Diego who is in a Thai lineage. And what he does is he goes around to these uh, Thai and Khmer and Cambodian gang members and starts talking to them about Buddhism and ends up uh, giving them ordination as priests. And they go back into their hood with, with these robes and, f and they get a huge lot of respect for that. And this is what we've been learning uh, from people like uh, uh, Harold Gilligan, psychiatrist, and from Marshall Rosenberg and Johann Galtung. You know, all people who have hit upon this from different angles. People who are threatening you, bullying you, what they're basically after, though they won't be able to articulate it most of the time, what they're basically after is some dignity, which is a totally renewable, self-growing resource. It's not a scarce resource. So what you want to do is – here we come back to L.A. Dungal over and over again – is to offer them some dignity so that they can then renounce the artificial dignity they were trying to achieve through intimidating you. So you're saying, on the one hand, you can't intimidate me. All I've got is a silly spear. I'm going to stand here and you know, fight to the death if I need to. But on the other hand, I'm not going to intimidate you. Okay, Joe? Oh, that's right, yeah. Well, uh, I can't summarize everything that you said for the camera, but the most important part is, I think, those two principles. And those are actually – now I've been boiling down and boiling down nonviolence to a set of very simple principles that you can put on a wallet-sized card and carry into the final exam. No, 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 not that one. <laughs> but uh, these would be two of them. It's it would human identity, who you think you are. And having alternatives, having another way to fulfill real needs because we've talked about this in the economic context, but we're now talking about it in the context of conflict that there really is no conflict among real needs. All conflict is a result of perception. 
in misperception. So I'm very impressed that this person could say to this – to these gang members this, this, that this line that you've drawn is artificial. It would be like saying the American flag is just a piece of cloth designed by Betsy Ross and modified over the years, you know, to saying that to certain people. <laughs> So it, it's – if you can – it's always the same thing. If you can break the bubble of unreality and ground people back in reality, you're on your way to resolving conflict, always. Yes, Marisa. Yes. <coughs> yes. <coughs> it's, it's all about trust. As so I was saying, okay, now uh, – yeah, if they had kept the guns, it would have been – Completely discordant. It would have been an entirely different story. Yeah. When they gave them back, they say were they were saying, We don't want these things. And they were saying, We don't fear you. We can give these back to you now. So actually it was kind of brilliant, the whole thing. Yeah. Shannon and then Alex. Right. 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 Yeah. Yes, yeah. I have this marvelous verse in the Bhagavad Gita that I've always liked so much where Krishna says to Arjuna – this is God speaking to the human soul uh, – okay, I've laid out the whole thing for you. This is the result of both these choices. Now, Varnishva, you choose. So this is the, the ultimate dignifying act that you can do to another human being is to give them choice. That's why uh, coercion and I, I don't know if the, and the idea of rape popped into my mind. The, the worst thing about it is denying the other person the choice to use their capacity for affection that way. Alex? Um, what Marisa said in her article – now, of course, as we know, the end is yet to come. and She was only there for a period of time – is that the women – now I'm going to use Shannon's vocabulary here – the women disarmed the men. But even at that, you know, they gave them a choice. They could have uh, – I don't know the military terminology here, but you circle the wagons. You know, they could have all, you know, regrouped and started shooting. Um, disarmed them, brought them to the village, had a long conversation with them. And then a very poignant thing comes up, which we've seen in the Judy Barry movie, which I wanted to get back to. We have a lot of loose ends back there. You have to have a whole third course here. And we've seen it uh, in the Bringing Down a Dictator movie where they say to the policeman, you're as much a victim as we are. They brought the soldiers – oh, terrific example. <coughs> I'm really glad I had that cookie, Amy. I'm <laughs> really hyped. Uh, <laughs> Gandhi's famous talk in 1931 <coughs> to the Lancashire mill workers. Remember, he had put these people out of work. They were angry at him. And the minute he heard they were angry at him, he did – what I <coughs> seem to be unwilling to do in such situations he said, let me go and talk to them. So he went unarmed into their midst. You know, this guy's about five foot three, doesn't even have any teeth. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, look, let me explain the situation to you. You've been exploited as badly as we have. Don't even dream of reestablishing the exploitive situation that existed before. And he said, I'm sorry that you have – 10,000 people unemployed. I have 100 million who are <coughs> unemployed. So the, the, what the one of the most poignant things that the villagers did was say to the soldiers, you don't want to be doing this to us. And some of those soldiers were immediately affected. And uh, yeah, I think I remember correctly. It's kind of a, a way that I would remember something whether it were there or not. <laughs> but I think I remember they were crying and they said, you know, People who were conscripted throughout Central South America, throughout Latin America, people who are conscripted are not Los Ricos, right? It's the people who have nothing, just like the people who are conscripted in the North in North America. The people who are living in the neighborhoods where they have no choice, they have no hope. 
So it's foolish not to go to them and appeal to the fact that, look, you and I are both on the same side. We're both being exploited. You're being tricked into victimizing me and they're hoping that we will suffer this victimization to take place. And as uh, uh, Patel says uh, – no, it was um, – one of the Ali brothers in the, in the Gandhi movie says, we will do neither. <laughs> so <laughs> I've always thought I should have been given a role in that. <laughs> Since I wasn't, I make up for it in this class. Uh, I have incidentally an, another interesting example that we could consider which I think uses the same principles in slightly different format and this is in Nigeria where the oil companies are going in and doing very much what Pemex did in Tabasco, extracting the oil, not even giving the local people jobs. And again, it's the women who have gone in and they've been kind of forceful. They have surrounded the oil men. You know, they have grounded helicopters. They have brought pumping stations to a halt. But they do it without weapons. In fact, a lot of the time they do it by disrobing because that has a certain significance and emotional impact in that culture which you would not have here. I'm not suggesting that you go to uh, <laughs> uh, the recruiting station <laughs> and try this. It will be read in an entirely different way in our culture. But it's actually a way of shaming and embarrassing those people. So again, it's using a kind of non-physically injurious force to disarm a threat and then proceed to the stage of negotiation. Ashley? Yeah, um, on that, I'm wondering like, okay, so once the soldiers are disarmed from that location mm. and they were going to mm. the stage there, okay, do they just abandon the soldiers? Uh, okay, and yeah. Mm -hmm. ties back to the thing. Um, I also work with like teens who've been convicted for gang violence and uh -huh. we kind of put them to like camps where they may still be in facilities and everything like that. Yes. Was that in Los Angeles? Um, no, in Northern California. Oh, so it's spreading. Yeah. Well, no, we, we had specifically done a different – it wasn't mm -hmm. designed specifically to be a different okay. community for them. So um, the, the, the beautiful thing was, yes, we, you know, we disarmed, you know, and there was a green light and there was peace. But mm -hmm. after that space was gone, mm -hmm. you know, and Right. To really, you know, mm -hmm. engage people completely. I mean, yeah. in that location. Mm -hmm. here. I'm glad you're uh, bringing this up. We we touched on this, but it's good to remind ourselves because we can lose sight of this. What we are talking about is an emergency situation. They didn't know the soldiers were coming. They caught wind of it. They rushed out just in time to confront them. So backing down from a conflict is step number one. <laughs> it gives you the space to proceed. And what we have seen, unfortunately, oh, I bet, I bet if we had the way to really do numbers on this scientifically and we stacked it up, I bet we would see that this is happening 90 percent of the time. People defuse a conflict and they say, phew, that's fixed. They go home. They go back into the same structural – violence that they left. Another example where we've seen this recently is in the uh, Neve Shalom Wahat al Salam experiment in uh, Israel started by a Carthusian priest, Bruno Hussar, where they had a high school and now it's a grade school and a high school where every year they have half Palestinian kids and half Israeli kids. And at the end of four years together, those kids are very very close. There's even this heartwarming episode where at the end of the experience there was a flood in a Palestinian village and in that village there was a boy who had been in the school in Wahat al-Salam and he got phone calls and even visits from all the Israeli kids in the school, not, not any of the Palestinian kids who were along with him. So, okay. But what we've discovered after 20 years of doing this is it goes up to that point and positions you to solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. 
to myself. I remember driving across the bridge here to San Francisco because I had been invited to be on a radio interview along with a person who had the rank of captain in the U.S. Army and who was part of what was then called the ROTC, now called Military Affairs. And so we're sitting in this car and he's teasing me, saying, you know, we, we get by on so little money and look at you people. <laughs> you know, I was trying not to either weep or lash out <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and then, you know, we started talking about deterrence and he said a very interesting thing from the standpoint of a military person. He said, deterrence is not a policy. We gave you <coughs> deterrence so that you could come up with a policy. And now for 25 years you've had deterrence and we still don't have a policy. So we're stuck with this. And it would be similar on our side. If we have a way of disarming and backing down from a conflict, but we then don't ask ourselves what caused this conflict to come into existence, let's use the strength we've just discovered to roll on one more step, you know, we're just going to have to repeat it and repeat it. I suppose that would be another way of saying this, this same thing. You know, say, yeah, that it's all OP and, and no CP. And you know, you can't blame these people. They've had no exposure to it. They, uh, it it doesn't, doesn't feel right. They have no faith in it. Okay. Well, I mean, just so you know, I'm not complaining, but I just want you to know, these were my notes for today. And we're up here. <laughs> Haven't gotten very far. So let's see. Let's, let's move on. But you know, I don't mean to rush things. If you have questions, we could come back to this. I felt that was very rich. So before we had John Lindsay Poland's uh, presentation on FOR, I had, had this uh, – took the bit in my mouth on Tuesday and ranted on and on about globalization from above and from below and how nonviolence figures into it in particular. And you guys didn't have a chance to even make a peep. So I'd like to say one more thing about that situation to kind of get us back into it a little bit and then see if you have any questions and then move on. What I want to move on to incidentally is uh, John's talk and then the readings and then I want to take a look at some of the uh, – nonviolent resistance movements within industrial societies, which is in the belly of the beast, so to speak. And then, though I doubt we will get to it today, I want to start talking about the largest social movement going on in the world today, which is called – the movimento de terras. Si. Say that again. Movimento de terras. Yeah. Movimento de terras. It's actually Movimento de Trabajadores en terras, MST. Good. I'm going to need you <laughs> while we roll into this. Uh, okay. So the one thing I wanted to say about uh, John's talk about Colombia, and incidentally there is uh, other things going on in Colombia also that I want to talk about very briefly if we get around to it. But I remember <coughs> having an eye-opening experience many years ago when we were starting peace and conflict studies. It was so early that we didn't even have classrooms on campus in those days. We were renting or borrowing, schnurring space from other buildings on the other side of Bancroft Avenue. And I was always saying someday we're going to pick up a rod and walk across Bancroft Avenue and the traffic will part <laughs> and then it will come back together and overwhelm the Egyptians and we will be in the promised land. Uh, so those were, those were very emotional times, especially around this time of year. And uh, I had a, invited a colleague of mine in from Nutritional Sciences, interestingly enough. We were, we were having talks – our best talks came from engineers, nutritional scientists and military people. Uh, a certain other social sciences, which I won't mention by name, were a complete washout. We got nothing out of them. 
they had learned the wrong models, whereas these people that were very useful hadn't learned anything, so <laughs> they could help a lot. So this particular talk that I found so <coughs> eye-opening was about the exploitation of agricultural products in history. And I had automatically assumed that the biggest problems would have been around the most important crops. So we're talking wheat, you know, and uh, I don't know, maybe since I was a vegetarian, that was what I was mainly talking about, you know, <laughs> wheat and <laughs> grains and rice, you know, very important to keep you these basic subsistence needs. And from Angela's point of view, she said in the history of exploitation of this kind of product, it had had almost nothing to do with those products. It had been about sugar, coffee, tea, and now, of course, cocaine and heroin. Not about needs, but about wants. So you can see the brilliance of Gandhi's basic, basic, fundamental – think of some more synonyms <coughs> – ultimate principle for restoring a sustainable economy was to get away from an economy of wants onto an economy of needs. And there'd be a lot less exploitation. Um, however, I'm beginning to wonder whether that situation is now changing while you still have – and of course, let me remind us all now that we're celebrating the end of slavery – that the entire slave trade was based on sugar. You know, that's why you have Afro-Colombians in Colombia and so forth. Um, so, but I'm wondering if maybe the global economic situation is shifting now and I'm wondering how that would influence us who are trying to come at this nonviolently. And that is uh, the biggest – struggle right now is about oil. And everybody is saying, and I'm sure they're correct, that in a very reasonably short period of time, like maybe 20 years, it'll be about water. It'll be about basic, basic, basic. And this is something that we ought to be thinking about. So with that little introduction, was there anything that you can recall or anything you've been thinking about, about the globalization talks that you'd like us to – get back to before we roll on. I realize this, this was a while ago and it's much harder to talk about globalization than it is to talk about what the Sariaku women did on that one afternoon. It's much more specific. So I won't be too disappointed if you don't have anything. <coughs> Paula? Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the questions that has always come up to me, and it comes all the way back to the sugar trade, mm -hmm. Brazil had a massive yeah. amount, about 70 percent of their slaves from uh, West Africa went to Brazil, and with, as you said, we're facing the yeah. same thing right now. Yeah. What could be done mm -hmm. on this? Because globalization. What could be done? Wow. Well, I was hoping that's what would come out of this semester <laughs> at the very end. Uh, I think partly what you're saying uh, is completely correct that globalization is a, an a, acute, intense mixture of opportunities and dangers. And the problem with it now is that the people who were most positioned to exploit it were the exploitive people. They had the institutions and the money and the power and the ideology and the culture all stacked up on their side. And so you have the trickle-down theory and the trickle-up reality. And that's a deadly combination because everybody's saying, uh, let it, let's cl uh, have wealth accumulate in the hands of the most capable people and it'll trickle down to the least capable. And for some funny reason, that doesn't happen because something called human nature gets in the way. 
So I think we can start to sketch an answer, and you even started yourself when you talked about fair trade. And another thing we haven't mentioned yet here is uh, green business. Where is Nick? Yeah. Green business. There are people who run very large corporations in an extremely fair way. So I think of Anita Roddick, for example. I think most of these people will turn out to be women for some funny reason. But uh, a friend of mine was at a meeting of high-level managers, and Anita Roddick gave a brilliant speech about how her, what her business, the body shop, does to try to redistribute wealth and be fair to everyone. And some very irate businessman got up and said, your main responsibility is to your stockholders. You should be maximizing profits. And what she said, I would not repeat uh, in mixed company. In fact, I wouldn't even repeat it in a smoke-filled bar room with nothing but, but scrawny teenagers <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> uh, so within the business establishment, there are people whose intention – we come back to that again – is not to maximize con uh, profits and accumulate power and centralize things, but to distribute resources. The problem is – in one second, Ashley – I think the problem is that although the structure has no intention, the structure is more <coughs> – uh, s more tempting, I guess. It's more susceptible to exploiters than it is to – what should we call ourselves? To progressives? To you – know, we don't – you know, huh? Lovers. Lovers. <laughs> there you go. Who's, who said the summer of love is over? <laughs> uh, it's, it's more uh, – they gravitate towards it naturally and they know exactly how to use it. Whereas for us, we tend to feel more comfortable in less centralized units. So what is to be done? I don't know, but I think maybe both continue to develop less centralized units, go to the World Social Forum. Every year it's gotten to be kind of rasty, but we'll, we'll put it back together and continue on and you know, be just people and have neighborhoods and build it up from there. But at the same time, I personally have no objection if uh, someone wants to do – to use corporate structures and mechanisms in a fair way, e even in a mostly fair way. Mm -hmm. Ashley. Um, well, to add on to that, I was just hmm? – I'm sure many of us in this room are opposed to Starbucks. And it's interesting yeah. because um, Starbucks now gets their scones from my friend who has this business and she's now the first woman in bakery in the whole world. Oh. And mm -hmm. so it's interesting how they are yeah. kind of incorporating this yeah. trend, trying to be more fair, trying to be yeah. different, and going to the corporate world. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know yeah. if there's any enforcer, good and bad, like you yeah. almost said. Like if you look at it, you have horrible things that are yeah. being introduced through the corporate wealth and greed, but yeah. they're trying to clean up their act in some areas. Some of them are, and I have a friend who was very well off. He was the biggest peace funder, to my knowledge, uh, in the world. I hung out, hung out with him quite a bit, <laughs> got absolutely nowhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, he started something called Businessmen for Social Responsibility. But he confided in me one time – it was one of those many talks when he told me he wasn't going to give me any money – that uh, that what we are is cheap hawks. You know, instead of spending billions and billions for weapons, we want to spend somewhat fewer billions for weapons. So that's, that's the further they had gotten at that point. Um, so even in Starbucks itself, you have both good and bad. I suppose the coffee is not that great, actually, between you and me. <laughs> I'm trying to go to Pete's. Uh, might be – das ist Geschmackssache, you know, just a matter of taste. Um, but A – okay, they do fair trade. They do, you know, green bakeries. That is green bakery. The products are not turning green. You understand? <laughs> but also, they're very – it's all very uniform, you know, and they take over smaller businesses that had a kind of humane character to them. I, mean, I remember 
I never shall forget visiting uh, Noam Chomsky at MIT. Is everybody impressed? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we decided to go down the hall and get a cup of coffee. And we're walking down the hall, and he tells me this sad story that we come around the corner, and there's an al Khalif and there's these two coffee machines, you know, where you put in two dimes or whatever it was in those days, and you get this <laughs> paper cup of tepid coffee. <laughs> it was terrible. And he said, you know, there used to be these two ladies who had a little coffee concession here, and they would hear me coming down the hallway. They would hear my steps. They would say, oh, here comes Professor Chomsky. And they would make me exactly the right coffee that I like and have it ready for me when I got there. Okay? So, but the university calculated that it was too much money to pay the salaries of these two people. So instead, they fired them. They brought in these machines. Guess what? The maintenance cost of these machines is 140 percent what it cost to pay those two ladies in that concession. So it's, it's a system that has to be played, if at all, very carefully. And you have to be very strong in yourself. You have to be a neat erotic who can get up there and say unprincipled things to these high-powered businessmen when they try and pull you off your course. But that's why I mentioned Mondragon last time, because this is, this is something which is <coughs> capitalistic in a sense, but it is a humane implementation of capitalism. And as I said, I said it then and I'll say it again, though I would not <coughs> have dared say it in the 70s. I'm not opposed to capitalism per se. As a friend of mine said, I'm not opposed to using foreign expressions per se. Yeah. Why not even be aware of that? Mm -hmm. It's something that because the intention is incorrect, it shouldn't even be oh, accepted. Or okay. Th this is a really good question, and, and I th think it has to receive a PAX 164B sophisticated, deep into the gray area, real world answer. And that is to say that in most of us, intentions are mixed. So when we say that the Saryaku women had good intentions were saying that their good intentions dominated at that point. I mean, and I, mean I can tell you something about Starbucks because a member of my family worked for them. Up to a certain point, they have very good employment practices. And if you went to any city in the world, there's bound to be a Starbucks every 50 yards, right? You could always apply for a job. At the same time, this person made one slight mistake and she's blackballed forever. You'd never be hired by another Starbucks. Situations like this would always deserve a little more research on your own mm -hmm. part, you know. Uh, like Starbucks is, I'm getting the sense, doing a lot these days, even mm -hmm. though they, they are a big corporation. Mm -hmm. they, they still, to some extent, exploit and they um, mm -hmm. do, they take little places out yeah. of business also. Yeah. And, you know, Nestle, for example, mm -hmm. they started a campaign about fair trade and mm -hmm. that turned out to be a total greenwash. So that's, a, yeah. you know, the term that everybody should be aware of. Yeah. Greenwashing. Green 140 products Nestle has, yeah. and they have one or two that are not yeah. fair trade and advertised everywhere. And then yeah. if you go into research, you walk around and be like, oh, Nestle is, you know, fair yeah. trade. They're yeah. Even though they're, they're not. Uh, yeah. And that took a lot of greenwashing because if you remember, Nestle was the most uh, hated corporation by lovers in the world because they were literally taking mother's milk away from babies and enslaving populations with this formula. That was like the beginning of what we see now in the Terminator seeds being done by Monsanto. So uh, I, I don't – I mean, I would be perfect – don't get me wrong. <coughs> you haven't gotten me at all yet, so you don't know whether I, – I would be perfectly okay with it if there were no corporations at all in about uh, 40 years. So not a single one. If you can totally reorganize the world on the basis of affinity groups, ashrams, <laughs> things like that, I would be perfectly happy. But I can also visualize a world in which – and this will be the next and final topic in our course – you change the culture.
to the point where enough good intention predominates in enough people so they could use the corporate machinery for good purposes. And, and I live about half an hour's drive from the first green dairy west of the Rockies. It was started by a family of Holocaust survivors, Strauss Dairy. They uh, – completely organic milk, no hormones, no nothing. The cow gets sick. They won't even treat it with uh, hormonal remedies. They have a fleet of electric cars. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they make very good ice cream. It can be done. But uh, we're not talking about a mega corporation. You know, we're talking basically about an extended family business. So it gets – for some funny reason, it gets hard. The bigger you get, the harder it is to keep your good intentions in play. Don't know what that reason is. Zoe? <laughs> uh, good. Let's hear it for Strauss's yogurt. <laughs> yeah, I, ha I hang out with them every Saturday in the local bakery uh, because I feel it's my contribution to the green environment. You know, <laughs> yeah, they have very good products. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, I think the a more nonviolent way would be the <coughs> paradigm. Uh, uh huh. Ooh, oh. Well, that is – yeah, that, that is similar to what Matthias is saying, uh, that uh, you do have to do some fairly careful investigation of where products have come from and what firms are doing. Uh, and it, as you say, Matt, it's not possible for one person to do all of that research. We – at our community, at our ashram, there was one person who got very interested in doing this and tried to go through and line out products that we shouldn't buy because there was something exploitive in <coughs> either the manufacturing or the delivery or the profit chain or what have you. And we, she soon began to realize that we'd be running around wearing grass clothing and l eating roots and apples, you know, that the, the, there's a certain amount of harm involved in all of them. And so ultimately you have to draw a line and say there are certain – I'll draw the line here and it becomes an individual matter. <coughs> if I could sum up a lot of what we were saying – I think it would be this, that when we are confronted with an exploitive institution, take action, but remember that it is the exploitation and not the institution that's the real problem. And we have to – if we only disestablish the institution, the same people will just roll over and do it again a different way. If you've seen that wonderful – series of Dr. Zhivago um, – I think it's Dr. Zhivago that I'm thinking of. There's somebody who is very close to the Tsar and serves him very faithfully. And you, you're worried about him when the revolution comes. You think he's going to be shot. But you find out that he's an important bureaucrat. He's an apparatchik in the revolution. And he, s he simply says, no matter who you are, you need bureaucrats. So you're always going to use bureaucrats. So what I'm just saying that it – again, it's not a different kind of people in power. It's a different kind of power in people. 
And I'm not saying don't try to disestablish institutions, but don't think that by doing that you've solved the problem because as long as you have the same culture, people will just rebuild it. So we have to do both and it requires a lot of canny intelligence to how to proceed. If it's all right with you, I'd like to use the next eight minutes uh, to talk about a few things that John brought up in, in his talk. Four things, actually. There's probably – yeah, say she. Uh -huh. I wanted to – what you think can elaborate more on the last talk, but you know, the conclusion that you made. Yeah. I don't know how we can separate the disruption from the institution because I feel like the institution was kind of the source of the exploitation or it is like the means yeah. to carry on and carry out the exploitation. So how can uh -huh. I guess, Seisha, that's a very good question and I guess what I'm saying is that in reality, exploitation is a drive. It's an emotion. It's a human drive and an institution cannot be the source of that drive. It can only be the mechanism through which it is delivered. And the example – I think you missed, you missed a class when I was talking about this. But in running over some of the features of globalization from the point of view of nonviolence, I talked about this very poignant remark made by a woman who was very active in the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. And I remember in those days people were saying that if, if South Africa could get over apartheid, the entire continent would be fixed. And that that would, did not quite happen. But one of the things that she said was, we rose up to seize the state only to discover that the state did not exist. Because the institution that was delivering their exploitation was the South African apartheid regime. So they hated it. All their intention went on changing that regime. The South African constitution guarantees, well, very simply, food, clothing and shelter to every single South African. And none of that has been delivered. Why? because of the Bretton Woods institutions that are supranational, that t have more power than the government and demanded that they make certain structural readjustments that once again it's more trickle up and more trickle up where wealth is siphoned up to the people who are already wealthy. So I'm not saying – first of all, I'm not saying that every situation is the same. There's some where you might want to be mostly – against the institution and only partly against the motivation and somewhere would be the other way around. <coughs> but generally speaking, our tendency is to get fascinated by the institution and not to see that these are human beings like us. Their negative drives are operating through these mechanisms. Okay, yes, we do have to disrupt that process. But unless we do it in a way that helps them recultivate their, uh, their intentions, it's, it's not going to solve the problem in any permanent way. We've seen that over and over again. Okay, the hell with my eight minutes. Go ahead, Paolo. <laughs> Yeah, but I think – I mean, mind you, I, I never patronized that particular chain but, and we have fought very hard to keep it out of our town nearby us. But I think it would still nonetheless be possible. I mean, my – call it a faith position, if you will, that in every person <coughs> there is both good and bad. And if you could get them to step back, contact what's good in them – I mean, here's an example I just used in a preface to a book. That I was asked to write, 
uh, in the tsunami in 2004. U.S. Marines were called in to do flood relief work and distribute food. And this, a Marine in Sri Lanka was interviewed at the end of a day, very long, hard day, very dangerous work. He said, I have been serving my country for 30 years and I never got any fulfillment out of it until today. So I even argue that you wouldn't have to disestablish the military, just disarm it. Contact those people in the military who are like this particular Marine, in whom the consciousness of service was always really there, and use it for different things. I mean, there, there used to be a U.S. Army Brigade. I don't know what they did with it. It was called the 1st Earth Battalion. <coughs> and these people, they were all about protecting the Earth. Jordan, did you have a question? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also, I guess one of the things I'm trying to understand is why people, you know, even if the things before were more Starbucks, Starbucks is starting to do like materially and economically some good things, why people still have some sort of weird feeling towards it, or like Wal 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 Walmart is <laughs> a long way to go in terms of doing really great economic and material things. But I think it's also the consciousness that we're not just material and economic and yeah. Yeah. <coughs> For me, that's where even if some of these institutions like like a Starbucks do start taking on better economic um, and material mm -hmm. practices, there's still this other part for me that, that is hard to let go of because yeah. it's still very important. And, um, yeah. I guess even if I was talking about the Bishop for a question, even Bardo is a, not not just his responsibility off of the individual and the culture and yes. the Yeah. Well, you said a lot, Jordan, and uh, with the one – the main thing that I'll pull out, I think, is about the responsibility piece. And it's like the choice thing that we were talking about before with the Sarayaku women, that the, the, the part – the thing that made corporations so bad was the decision in the 19th century, which wasn't – like most decisions, most of the most important decisions were never discussed. They just happened. It's a funny thing about our very talkative civilization here. But this decision that corporations had rights, because you take responsibilities away from people and give rights to, to corporate entities, to collectives, you've made such a huge mistake that it's not recoverable. And this is at the very heart of the damage that's been done by the corporate system. So I think we would have to go that far, and I, th I hope we will <laughs> in, the, in the years to come, building down that system and reorganizing it. While I'm not uh, – I would not insist that there be no corporations. They somehow have to be cor corporations acting as corporations not corporations pretending to have consciousness as people because it's people who are giving away their consciousness to those corporations. So, Joe, you're going to have to come up and t tell me your comment uh, after class. Uh, so I'm going to try to show you a clip from an MST film and part of an interview from an India a Gandhian who visited Meta a while ago. Repeat Jordan's announcement that next Wednesday in La Pena in the evening there will be actual presentation by someone from MST. Okay, this was a great conversation. <laughs> I enjoyed it very much. Hope you did also.